All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm really honored to be moderating this panel with um, a really great group of people. So um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Sharon Goldberg. I'm the CEO of a Boston startup called Arwin. You may know us also as Commonwealth Crypto, which was our previous name. I'm also a computer science professor at Boston University, um, and I work on network securities um, and blockchain now, too. So. Um, what I wanted to do was just start by going through and having each one of the panels, panelists introduce themselves, tell us where they work, what they do. Um, and then um, I'm gonna lay down a ground rule. We're gonna be talking about vulnerabilities in this panel. And I want everyone when they're talking about a vulnerability not just to like refer to it by name like the uh, BCH consensus vulnerability, like you have to explain what it is because maybe people don't know. Um, so that way we can all learn um, to make sure that we're all clear on exactly what vuln we're talking about. So hopefully what is gonna happen in this panel is you're gonna learn about at least like seven or eight interesting vulnerabilities that have come up in the last two years. Okay, so let's start with the introduction. Uh, I'm, can you hear me? I'm, I'm Corey Fields, I work here at MIT. Actually, I, I work remotely um, for, for the DCI. I actually live in DC. Um, I uh, am, am per particularly interested in, in the uh, real-world uh, applications of, of cryptocurrency security. So a Andrew talked earlier about the, the, the kind of math and the theoretical stuff. To, to me, what's interesting is, is kind of where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, yeah, I'm James Lovejoy. Uh, I work... Uh, here at the DCI, I'm also an undergrad student here at MIT. Uh, I guess I'm on this panel in my capacity as the lead maintainer of Burkcoin, which was recently subject to a few 51% attacks, uh, which Mark, who was supposed to be on this panel, I guess, was the person who wrote about them. Uh, so I'm here in his place. Hi, I'm Carl Dong. I work at Chaincode, and uh, I, I'm interested in a lot of the same things that Corey is. Um, um, basically, built system security. Uh, I also maintain uh, Rust Bitcoin uh, along with Polstra, who you know spoke earlier today. Great. Um, so I have a bunch of questions that I've prepared. So I'm just going to ask them and have you guys kind of opine about them. So, um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, vulnerability disclosure in the blockchain world. So um, you know, I'm sure most people in this room have heard of responsible disclosure. Um, which is a, a process that's typically used when you're a security researcher and you're like finding a vulnerability in something that's maintained by a centralized entity, as most software is maintained by a centralized entity. So for instance, if I find a vulnerability in um, Airbnb's website, I'll probably report that to Airbnb. And it's very clear what I'm expected to do, right? So I should disclose the vulnerability to Airbnb, give them some time to fix it. I put a time window on the amount of time they have to fix it, and then I say I'm going to go public after this point, right? So that forces the entity in which you found the vulnerability to actually fix the bug um, and not to take forever, right? And not to like leave this vulnerability open for a long time, right? So you as a security researcher have some power to basically like embarrass the entity for whom you found the bug and that forces them to fix it in a timely manner. So that's in a centralized um, setting, right? But when we're talking about a, a blockchain system, um, we're talking about Bitcoin, who do you report the vulnerabilities to? Um, and how do you actually go through this disclosure process? And I'm, I'm personally very interested in this question because who remembers the selfish mining paper that came out? Right, so that paper was just revealed publicly without really a disclosure process because the authors argued that there was no one to disclose to. There's no centralized point to disclose this, this bug to. And I think with something like um, with Bitcoin today, we probably don't want to do that because the Bitcoin's worth a lot of money. So we need to find a process for actually dealing with this. So I'm just curious about, um, for the panelists, what do you consider a good process for vulnerability disclosure for something that is as decentralized as Bitcoin or Ethereum? Um. Yeah, so there's there's a really big difference between how things should work and how things do work. So in in, in theory, there should be no one to report a vulnerability to. If, in in theory, if you find a vulner, vulnerability, you should fix it yourself and and maybe get everyone else to to, to try to fix it too. In in reality, um, the, the 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 people who develop the software, uh, it, it's it is clumpy. It's just it's just a matter of fact that way. So. Um, in, in, in reality, there, there is somebody to report to, um, but the, the, the question of, of how gets a little bit tricky um, because there's, there's a chance that in, in reporting the vulnerability, you're, you're also very much um, uh, kind of putting yourself on the line as well because you're, you're, you're admitting that you know something, um, and then at that point, and, until the thing has been fixed, 
uh, if 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 it's exploited or, or if, if the attack goes off in any way, um, then there's there's a there's a, a, a record of you knowing it bef kind of before anybody else. So so the disclosure has, process has to be um, anonymous, or, or in, in in a lot of cases of, of like of of um, really serious kind of consensus failure issues, um, it, it has to be anonymous, and that that introduces a, a whole series of challenges. So can you go into why it has to be anonymous? Like what are the risks if your name is publicly known before you do the disclosure? Um, so, so like, like I just said, so I, um, so to, to do the, th the thing that you, you said not to do, so I, I, uh, I, I discovered the, the Bitcoin Cash um, uh, consensus failure about, about a year ago. And, and so, so a very quick summary, um, uh, you, e each, each node maintains a set of consensus rules and, and the fact that, that each node validates the, the block the same way is, is what defines what is a, a good block. And so if, if you have two sets of, of nodes that disagree on what the rules are, then there's no real definition of correct. And so what happened in, in Bitcoin Cash is they released a new version where there was, a, there was a, a bug in the consensus code that they didn't mean to introduce. It was, it was an accidental change um, that actually introduced a, a potential for a hard fork if someone were to, to create a, a, a transaction crafted in a very specific way. So, when, when, I, when I discovered that, I, I initially wanted to go through a pretty typical disclosure process. I wanted to you know, find out who the, who the, who the devs were and, and, and encrypt a, um, a, a disclosure with a timeline and, and, and that kind of thing, like you said. Um, but but I, I, I soon realized that if, if, I, if I attach my name to that, um, be, because crypto, crypto software, can't, you can't just roll out an update overnight. It, has to, it, it, takes, you know, um, it takes weeks or, or, or months to, to get kind of a majority share on the network of, of the new running version. So it's not something that would just be fixed overnight. So for the whole time that, but between the, the time that, that I, I um, gave the, the bug report to the fact that, to, to the time that it's fixed, um, I have my name on something saying, I know a vulnerability. And at any point, if, if somebody uses that, then it, it, it looks like it's me. So there's, there's, I don't think, any way to avoid, without really, really risking yourself, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to avoid doing that w without doing that, honestly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, do you want to go ahead? So how do, you view, how do you view vulnerability disclosure processes? Yeah, I guess from my perspective, at least, I guess when it comes to altcoins, they're often a lot smaller than the Bitcoin community by you know, a couple of orders of magnitude. So oftentimes you're gonna have one, maybe two technical developers on the team who are actually able to respond to this kind of thing. Uh, so for a lot of altcoins at least, figuring out who to disclose to is actually quite easy. Uh, the difficulty then becomes, as you alluded to earlier, how do you contact that individual? Because often that individual is a Bitcoin talk username uh, who is probably not checking their DMs. Uh, so, you know, you could make uh, an issue uh, that's like a really critical security vulnerability that doesn't go answered for, you know, months or ever even. Uh, so I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, due diligence of people actually using these coins and seeing, well, are there actually any people behind this to deal with security vulnerabilities? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, most recently with... Uh, there was an issue in Bitcoin Core where there was an inflation bug where, I, you know, theoretically you could produce a transaction which generated lots of coins that shouldn't be there. And most altcoins uh, that aren't on Ethereum are reliant on Bitcoin Core in some way. And so in that case, you know, unless someone was really paying attention to the news and saw that the bug was released, uh, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of Bitcoin Core-based currencies that are still vulnerable to this bug. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Oh, I, I think they covered all I can okay, great. say. Uh, I just want to go into one of the things that you said. So, so um, I think a really interesting problem is sort of the propagation of the bug to the dependent software projects, even for that same coin, or the, the coins that are derived from that coin, right? So I can tell from our experience a year ago with Ethan Heilman and Yuval Marcus, both of which are in the room right over there, um, we found a vulnerability in Ethereum's peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and we um, disclosed that to Geth. So we did the research on Geth, and we disclosed it to the Geth maintainers. Um, and so it was fixed in Geth, and then it was revealed publicly. But at the end of the day, there was also you know, the parity implementations that were affected. There was Ethereum Classic that was affected. And we didn't actually go and do the disclosure to each one of those dependent projects. right? And so it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting problem of like, 
how do you cope with the propagation of the vulnerability downstream to all the coins that are essentially depending on the coin base, on the, the code base that that, that that starts with? So maybe we can start from Carl here, actually, because we let you off the hook on the last one. Like, what do you think the right way for a security researcher to cope with this like crazy dependency that we have of code in all these open source projects? Yeah. Um, so th there are multiple ways to talk about this. Um, I think. Um, for Rust, we actually have a bunch of developers who are working on an auditing system where you can submit audits of your dependencies. Um, for Rust Bitcoin and you know uh, projects under the Rust Bitcoin org, we just tend to minimize as you know as as little dependencies as possible, right? Uh, is the is the way that we would do it. Um, I think one of the things that people don't really think about that much is. Um, the security of uh, build systems and all the way leading up to the release process, um, uh, more specifically reproducibility and bootstrapability. Um, so to, to make clear what I mean, you know, um, for for most users, you know, if you want to install Bitcoin Core, you uh, get it from your package manager, or maybe you go on GitHub releases and download the tarball, and um, uh, and you know, some people verify the SHA-256, but you know, I'm lazy, sometimes I don't. Some people verify the PGP signature, but sometimes you don't. But even if you have looked at the code base and you looked at the signature and they're all good, um, this doesn't mean that the binary that you have is correct, right? Um, you know, it's, it's not, it's still vulnerable against, you know, a core developer just being like, hey, let's insert some code that uploads your private key and let's, you know, put that binary up on the servers. Um, so that leads into sort of, you know, how, how do you have reproducible, um, reproducible builds, which means that you can sort of go through the steps of the build process and look that bit for bit, um, this was actually a good binary. Uh, and the way that we've done this since, I think, 0.4, uh, is through Gitian. Uh, and uh, I think the Tor browser bundle also used it for a bit. And uh, yeah, so this reproducible thi build thing is happening all across the industry. I think Debian is uh, ha have putting a lot of effort into reproducible builds, which is fantastic. Um, and, and this, you know, obviously you, you want to have reproducible builds for your dependencies as well. Uh, and, and talking about dependencies, um, one of the one of the other important things is the sort of the other side of the coin is being able to bootstrap, right? So, you know, being reproducible doesn't mean that you're good inherently. It, it can be that you are reproducibly malicious, as in you always produce a binary that uploads your private key, right? Which, you know, is still not good. So you need to be able to audit your not only your runtime dependencies, but also your build time dependencies, uh, such as, you know, GCC make and whatever. Um, and that, uh, that means you know, limiting the number of trusted binaries that you have, uh, and a side effect of that is actually you will be able to run the builds on more diverse machines, not only Ubuntu, but you know, all the distributions, because you only depend on you know, a sane glibc, GCC, and binutils. Um, and so th there's been a bunch of efforts on that front. Uh, you know, Corey's built uh, most of Turtles that I've helped with a, a little bit. And it, it, it tries to build a tool chain uh, that re produces reprodu uh, reproducible binaries. Uh, and I've been most recently working on uh, using Keeks, which is a functional package manager, to achieve all of this, um, which helps with you know, an attack that people don't really think about, but they should be thinking about, because I feel like it's quite easy to insert malicious code into tool chains. Yeah, 100%. I mean, just from you know, like my perspective, I think the vast majority of altcoins are not even using Gishian. I think they're just making binaries and signing them. So uh, you are really trusting the developers of, of the coin. Yeah, there, there's a there's a repo called gitian.sigs where anybody can upload their, you know, well, make a PR to upload the, uh, the signature of the Gitian outputs. Um, and the altcoins should also do so. So, so going, going back to the um, kind of the, the uh, downstream coins and, and who to disclose to, I think what, what Carl was getting at is, is that it's, it, it's, it's clear what would happen if, if, there's, a, if there's a bug in, in, so Bitcoin Core is an example, you know, it, it, there, there are lots of coins that, that, are, that are derived from Bitcoin Core, so um, kind of what, what to do or it's it, it, it's clear to where, where to start if there's a bug in Bitcoin Core. You you, you look at it downstreams, um, but, but as as developers of this stuff, we're we're really paranoid about it. So so what, kind of what 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 Carl was saying is that 
it could be as bad as a, as a vulnerability in GCC that affects all cryptocurrencies. Or you know, it, it could be a, um, a OpenSSL is, is, a, is a great example because that's happened before in, in, in the cryptocurrency world. So um, who, who to disclose to? This is, this is something that I've, I've talked about with Neha over and over, and, and I, I think we're finally kind of on the same page. Uh, I, I really think that in, it, it, it always has to be a case-by-case -case basis, a case-by-case -case evaluation as, as to who to disclose to, because there, there are just so many complications that if you, if you try to define any policy ahead of time, so that, that, that's kind of been the, the discussion. So you know, come up with the policy. If, if, if you discover a bug, who will you disclose it to? Um, and, and what we found is, or, or what, what I, I've found is, is that every, every case will, will, will vary in, in, a, in a very slight way that's enough to, to kind of destroy any like templated approach that you might make. Can I go just to this downstream question, which I think is kind of interesting. Like, do you think as a, a does, let's say, does Bitcoin Core have a responsibility to kind of inform all the derived code bases that there's a vuln before they release? So like, if you look at, um, like in the non-cryptocurrency um, world, um, so for instance, like we had a vulnerability in network time, um, which is like how their clocks work. So when that was found, we disclosed to the network time um, foundation. And then they have like a, a, a list of people that they do early disclosure before the public disclosure to give those operating systems basically an opportunity to fix the bugs before it goes public, right? So there's sort of like this like subscriber list of like, yeah, I'm going to be very dependent on your software. And so I really want to know when you know about a bug, I should know about it before the whole world knows about it. Like, do we need something like that in this space? Like maybe subscribers to the code base that get an early notification? Because I've seen it just happen. Like the code base gets a notification and then the world gets a notification. Yeah, I mean, most recently, and the way it worked for us at least is it was completely world of mouth based disclosure, you know, basically on the day of announcement. So. And it's something is better than nothing, that's how I'll put it. But yeah, I agree, it has to happen on a case-by-case -case basis because, I mean, there are tons of coins where I, I would say I would not be confident that the developers uh, would you know, maintain discretion when it comes to the information. Uh, and so whilst you may be telling them with the hope that they'll you know, update their Bitcoin core version and rebase, uh, they may actually instead use it to just exploit some other coin that they know to be vulnerable. Uh, the other problem is, is even if you know you know all these coins rely on Bitcoin Core, you have no idea which version of Bitcoin Core they're relying on. I would not be surprised if a lot of projects are still using 0.8 of Bitcoin Core, which actually wasn't vulnerable to this particular and, issue. And, and you also don't know you, you also don't know if it's if it's necessarily similar enough. So Zcash, as an example, um, hasn't shared most of our consensus failures because they, they've changed so much of that code. So in order to be proactive, in order to try to to try to provide two downstreams, that means a lot of actual work. That means going through each code base and, and, and some, so for, for the Bitcoin Cash thing, I, 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 when I discovered that, I, I burned a, a couple days on it because um, I found it, I, I kind of couldn't believe it at first, but then I, I had to start writing tests and I was, I, I like, I unplugged my router from, from the, the, the wall because the last thing I want to do is, is broadcast one of these transactions, but I had to make sure that it, it actually worked. So there's a good amount of, of effort that goes into actually making sure because one thing that you don't want to do is let somebody know that they're vulnerable when they're actually not. Because then you've just told some, then you know, if somebody has knowledge of this that doesn't need it. Okay, so um, let's take uh, sort of a new topic. So I'm going to ask each person here to tell us about their favorite vulnerability that they heard about in the last couple of years. Um, you can even tell us about two. So you can tell us about one that you thought was patched in a really ex effective and successful way. And then you can tell us about one that you think was like a total disaster. And if you don't feel comfortable like revealing a total disaster, that's fine. But um, which, where should we start? I did tell you guys ahead of time that I was going to do this. There was a list. So <laughs> where should we start? Who's ready? Sorry, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll, I'll start, but I'll cheat. OK, the good and the bad. Oh. Good one and a bad one. Wow. Good. You, can, you can do only a good one if you don't have a bad Good one. and bad are kind of hard, hard to define in, the, in this context. But, but to, to me, the Bitcoin Cash thing was, was obviously the, the most interesting to me because it, it um, I, I, was, I was very alone in the process. There was no, um, there, there, there were no guidelines. There was no documentation. There, was, there had been no other big high-profile disclosure for this kind of thing. And I, and, and I, I, I couldn't even talk to you know, the, the people that I work with, my, my, um, my, my peers, so kind of, it, it was it was a really interesting process to, to go through, um, and it, it was it was it was also very very strange to 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 feel like I was wielding that power for for a couple of days. 
Um, so it, it kind of it kind of really hit home how uh, uh, fickle the uh, a cryptocurrency can be. If it can be brought down, uh, it was literally one bit. If you if you if you flip one one bit in a transaction, that would have been enough to destroy a crypt cryptocurrency, and that's that's terrifying. Uh, yeah, I guess for me, most recently, I think it was last year, there was a bug in the SPV wallet Electrum where uh, the RPC remote control interface was listening on all interfaces without a username and password by default. So effectively, if you were running Electrum on your computer and then you went on a, you know, von a website with an exploit on it, it would be able to log into your Electrum wallet. And if your Electrum wallet was not you know, password protected, uh, the you know, private keys were not encrypted, then you could theoretically spend all the coins. And I guess this also comes back to the disclosure issue. That also was disclosed to the Vertcoin project, at least on the day, along with everyone else. So anyone who was running Electrum VTC, um, who you know, didn't have an encrypted wallet, someone could have just put some JavaScript code on any web page and lifted all of your coins from the wallet. So highlights the difficulty. I sometimes feel like the only thing that protects us is like how complex these bugs are and how hard it is to understand them. So it's like the people who can fix them have a little bit of a head start because you actually understand what's going on. And then the rest of the world has like figures it out and by then you've patched it. That's maybe I, But the again, only it's thing. like flipping one bit or like ten lines of JavaScript on a web page is enough to But that's that's a really good observation though, because most most of the disclosures have come from developers. Right. Yeah, I mean <clears throat> talking about things that are, you know, present out there that are too sort of complex for people to exploit or people just don't want to. Um, you know, um, things that are, um, are ring zero bugs like uh, Intel Management Engine or, you know, IPMIs that are out there that have buggy firmware. You know, these are things that exist in modern data centers um, and Intel ME. I think Intel's trying to like basically push it to every Intel machine possible. Um, and they basically have, you know, more than kernel access, more than root access to your entire machine. Um, and so, yeah, I think people should look at that. Um, and I think, you know, Google's had some efforts into that. There's a bunch of projects like Nerf, a um, bunch of core, I mean, core boots doing a lot of things with BIOS and so all that. So can we get into that for a second? So mm. how would a bug in Intel Management Engine affect Bitcoin? How does that work? Walk us through the process. Uh, well. Basically, I mean, we, we, we have protection. I think the kernel protects processes from accessing each other's memories. Uh, and if you have basically more than kernel access to uh, memory, then you can be able to be basically be able to read anything that's on there. Um, and I think that's bad. Uh, and also, mm -hmm. um, so basically, they read memory, yeah, they learn and secret keys, and they steal your money. Exactly. And, and, and like, UEF, like the UEFI stack sometimes is very bloated. The UEFI stack sometimes uh, includes a network stack in it as well. So if you, you know, some, uh, and of course your IPMI also can communicate over ethernet. So sometimes if you plug your ethernet into the wrong port and plug it into IPMI, you, you're able to shut down the machine, restart the machine uh, from a network port um, if you didn't, uh, you know, reset your, reset your password for IPMI or actually set some kind of security for your IPMI. So yeah. Carl, you're setting off like, um, I'm about to ask an obnoxious question now, uh -huh. okay? Because you're setting <laughs> off like this dilemma that I always have in my own head. So uh -huh. a lot of us here come from this world in which like, you know, not your keys, not your coins. And that's certainly like the world that I come from, right? And then we have Carl here telling us that like, I don't even know, some part of the stack I've never heard of is gonna have a vulnerability that's gonna allow this thing to go into memory and steal all my coins. And that sounds really bad, right? So like, I don't yes. want this thing on my computer, right? I mean, what's our view? What's your view on like, this whole, this whole notion of like, we're trying to move into this world in which we all hold our own keys, we don't have to trust a centralized entity with keys, and then on the other hand, we have these like computer systems that are so complicated that a bug in the God knows what is going to basically steal all your money that you've never even heard of, and maybe you're like, you're, you know, you're running all the antivirus and you've cleaned everything up and you're running a VM that's completely wiped with nothing and only has your coin on it. Yeah. And still you have these vulns. Like, what, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> what do we do? Uh, I, I, <laughs> I think that the tech world has been moving a little too fast and haven't been really thinking about security that much. Um, but I, I think, well, maybe it's bad news, but the only way we're going to get this is, is if more vulnerabilities are exploited in the wild and, you know, people's <laughs> attentions are drawn towards this because, you know, I think 
you know, a lot of companies, they, they ign perhaps ignore the advice of their security researchers because, you know, they got to move fast, they got to have revenue. Um, but we're, we're really entering, with, with cryptocurrencies, I think we're entering a world where, you know, vulnerabilities that were theoretical are now extremely profitable to exploit. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, they'll bring things to the forefront. Yeah. So what would be the right way for me to store my coins? I don't know, paper wallet? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think if you bought one of those like open FPGAs, wrote your own hardware implementation. <laughs> you use like you a hex safe. dice, generate your private key and uh, paper wallet. Okay, we're we're on the road. We're, get, we're gonna get there. We will get there. I mean, maybe um, the future is like open hardware, right? We've sort of got to a point where we have a lot of open software that we can all read the code of, but at the moment we're still completely reliant on totally proprietary hardware. So. Power yeah. nine Talos. Okay, um, so I want to go to a different topic. How much time do we have? Yeah. Uh, okay, then I'm going to stop asking questions. Great. So, questions from the room. So, first of all, I'll um, I want to commend Corey, and uh, there were a few other examples of, of Bitcoin developers who um, were responsible even to altcoins when other developers may consider them to be uh, irresponsible adversaries. Um, so I thought that it's worth mentioning that um, uh, beyond uh, Bitcoin, in much older... Um, like somewhat decentralized open source industries like the, um, like the Linux kernel. Um, as we've seen uh, last year, this is still not a solved problem when it comes to um, responsible disclosure. Um, when like Spectre and Meltdown happen, you know, where it put at risk everything on the cloud uh, like, by the way, you should never use the cloud. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it, it never will be securable. But it, uh, it, uh, it, it was interesting, especially to read about um, how disclosure happened to the different cloud providers. Like, uh, there are, you, you know, like Amazon AWS, and then. Um, like the other uh, larger brands, and then like tier two and tier three, and like only the largest heard anything at all, and and the smaller providers that a lot of people use, um, like um, a lot of you probably use like Linode or DigitalOcean. Um, I don't remember exactly who they were, but they were caught uh, flat-footed because, like, they were not trusted with this, like, earth-shattering information. So, like, this is not a solved problem for even larger industries. Um, that's my comment. Uh, you want to come up? Yeah. Okay, no, just shout. Yeah. Oh, we're live. Okay, if people want questions, like, come line up at the mics because we're running out of we're running out of time here. Um, in a future where on-chain governance is more common, how would that change your vulnerability disclosure processes? On-chain governance. So the question was, in a, in a future where there's on-chain governance, how would that change disclosure processes? Uh, so I personally don't think it would, because I don't see how on-chain governance can enforce anything in the real world. Uh, the reality is, is you know, someone who has a vulnerability is going to find someone to disclose it to, irrespective of what your blockchain says that person should be. So maybe it would be helpful to give guidance, but equally I think you could just like put a text file on pastebin with that information and it would have a similar level of enforceability. There, there could also be a bug in the governance model code. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you want to ask a question? Are you? Um, it might be a stupid question. Um, there are no stupid, I think are no stupid from, questions. From someone who is not a security researcher. Um, so I think, from what I understand, you're assuming that this environment that you're in is highly adversarial. That's the whole point of being a security researcher. Um, 
And so I guess what I was wondering is like, what is the point in doing disclosure when, like Carl said, it's highly profitable to be actually exploiting these bugs? And like, perhaps maybe is there a kind of incentivization structure that you could set up such that disclosure is like more, or is better for the ecosystem in general or whatever it is? But I guess my main question is like, what is your incentive? What is your incentive to like actually disclose as opposed to just? I, I feel like I, I'm exploding to talk about the answer. <laughs> Can I take it? Because <laughs> I teach computer science, right? And I teach it to like young people who are some of the really eager and they're just going to go out. Um, so when you've, you've all over there joined my lab when he was very young, and I told him that if he exploits this vulnerability, I'm going to kick him out. I'm never going to talk to him again. <laughs> you know, because because basically, as a person who does this type of work, you have a code of ethics. We're like doctors. You don't go killing your patients, right? It's the same set of ethics that all of us feel and like feel very, very, very deeply. Like to the point where, like, if one of my students or one of my colleagues would do something like this, I'd be like, push them to the wolves. Like, I'm not going to work with you or talk to you again because this is just not what we do. And actually, like technologists, as technologists, I feel like we do live by a code of ethics, right? That's why, you know, um, certain companies that I won't name by name that have been in the news, you know, you look and you see, like, some of the technological steps that they've taken would be viewed by security researchers as unethical. So as an example of something that was, like, really obviously unethical from a technology perspective was, like, if anyone remembers Superfish in the Lenovo laptops, right? So they installed a root certificate in, the, in all Lenovo laptops that shipped to your house that could decrypt all your traffic and read everything and then inject ads for you. And this, as a technologist, is like totally unethical. Like, and any engineer that you would talk to would say, like, this is completely unreasonable because the user did not opt into this. They think they're getting a secure connection, and they're not. So like, I think most people that are here live by this code of ethics, and it's just like, totally beyond the pale to even consider exploiting it for, for profit, right? I would totally make much more money if I was exploiting things for mm -hmm. profit, but we just don't do it. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, Hacker One. I know that's one site that a lot of smaller projects are using to encourage disclosure. Uh, but again, the issue there is you need money. So, you know, if you want to discourage someone from attacking your system, you have to provide them more money than they would presumably get from launching the attack. But at the end of the day, we don't get more money, right? I think yeah. that most people are basically living in their hearts by a code of ethics that says you just don't do this. Same way doctors don't go around killing patients that they don't like. Also, bad code is icky, and it kind of <laughs> makes you feel better when it's not bad code anymore. That's a good question. Very good. Uh, so I'll try to ask an even dumber question that I myself can see lots of problems with. But uh, you can trawl through GitHub and grab the PGP keys of all the committers who signed a given thing. You can also trawl through it and see all the forks of a given repository. Now, GitHub is centralized and all that stuff, but nonetheless, it's a data science problem to extract a set of PGP keys of people who are responsible for the code. And in this space, there's always going to be a problem with who do I trust? Do I, do I disclose to Coinbase? Do I disclose to Chaincode Labs or Blockstream or anybody else? And you're never going to have a good answer to that question. Um, so what if uh, somebody trawled through, grabbed all those pub keys, encrypted a message to all those committers, and sent it to them? I, I can see lots of problems with this, but discuss. <laughs> I would be amazed if the majority of projects have PGP keys associated with them. That's, that's actually something that, that we are, uh, the, uh, Neha and I actually are, are directly working on um, tr trying to get, to get GitHub to, to support um, a Disclosure.md, just like they support uh, a readme.md and a... Uh, contributing. Yes, contributing.md. So um, to, to kind of, and it would have, have fields for, for at, 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 minim, at minimum, email address and PGP, t, PGP key to, to kind of encourage projects, not only cryptocurrency projects, but like all projects to, to think of this as a default. Um, I need to have, I, I need to tell people where to report things to. And I, again, these projects should not be able to do that, but in, in reality, that's, that's really that's common. How it actually, works. like for internet routing, like IP addresses will have a like uh, you know send me, mail me if there's a problem kind of email address associated with them. Okay, this is the last question. Okay, this is not a question, but um, a recommendation. Um, we were you uh, we were just discussing code of ethics. So I'm I'm from a neighboring community to security research, namely cryptography research. And a cryptographer named Phil Ragway gave a wonderful invited lecture at AsiaCrypt or EuroCrypt or Crypto, I forget which, uh, two or three years ago. Ragway, R-O-G-A-W-A-Y, uh, about the ethics of cryptography 
research and how, how it should be practiced. Uh, you can find it, Ragaway Invited Lecturer Ethics. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. This was a really interesting conversation. Thank you.